All right, thank you everybody for coming. We're gonna talk about making Cassandra easier for AI developers. I realize that this sounds very similar to probably five other talks that you saw on the agenda throughout the course of this conference. Um, and I think we're making a point. I'm just gonna make one small slice of a point that you probably heard from some other talks. Um, it's gonna be pretty complimentary to what you've heard. Um, but one of the things that I think has been really interesting about this conference is sort of that blurring of the lines between the Cassandra Summit and AI.dev. I didn't know what AI.dev was when I got here, I'll confess. Um, and it's kind of blown my mind, this idea of uh, the foundations of the AI revolution are open source. That's really what's gonna drive things forward long term. Um, I'm now a believer in that. I'm also a believer and have been of what Chet shared in his keynote that Cassandra is the database for this. So again, this is just one slice of that. Um, so very glad to be here. Maybe we won't remember this as the first Cassandra Summit since 2016 or whatever it was. Maybe we will all be claiming uh, you know, five years from now that we were at the first AI.dev. I don't know, time will tell. So let's see where this goes. Okay, um, I don't have a slide at the beginning that tells you what I'm gonna tell you. The whole outline thing, I skipped that. Um, but I'm gonna tell you a story. And th there's, a, there's a premise here about making AI, uh, Cassandra easier for AI developers. Okay, that means that it's hard for at least some developers. So let's talk a little bit about why Cassandra is hard or has been hard for developers. Um, so I wrote a book uh, and people, I'm gonna pick on Aaron because he just walked in the back. People like to give me crap about the Cassandra book. Um, does anyone have any ideas why that might be? Dang it. No, that's not it. Uh, okay, so basically I work at Datastax, which is a company that, you know, for the past several years has been building a cloud service. Um, there's a couple of other folks that are doing this. And we're basically trying to invalidate large portions of this book. So uh, I had a coworker mention to me recently that there was a part of the book that they would like to obsolete. And I was like, oh, you're talking about the whole second half of the book where we talk about operations, right? Because we're building Astra. Uh, and he, was, he said, no, I hate the data modeling chapter. <laughs> by, the, by the way, this was Ed, our chief product officer. And I said, what? You hate the data modeling chapter? And he said, yeah, because you throw partitioning all up in my face. And you tell people that in order to correctly data model for Cassandra and build performance systems, um, you have to get your data model right. <clears throat> um, I admit that's right. So what if the chapter that we obsolete is the data modeling chapter? Uh, okay, I, I'm um, a, a couple of years past the season of my career in which my whole job was telling people how to be good with Cassandra. So look, I'm just bringing the receipts. We're not gonna dwell on this very much, but um, yes, I've taught people a lot about partitioning and how to design your data model, you know, Here's my training slides, okay? They're small in purpose, so you don't read them. All right, so hey, there's a whole process that we went through, right? Not only do you have to have a conceptual, logical, and physical data model, there's also this thing called access patterns that you have to come up with, because it turns out if you wanna get your data in more than one way, the same data, but you wanna query it in a different way, you, act, you gotta design a whole different table. And this is what we've been telling people for years. And actually, it turns out this is still true if you want the most optimal performance. Um, but actually, we're getting pretty good at performance the other way. Um, but, but there's more to this complexity. So I would go uh, and, and be one of the people that would deliver you know, a week-long training class, right? Um, because we wanted to make sure to let you know that in order to be competent to touch this, you must have at least one week of training. Um, and that's if you're paying attention, right? If you weren't paying attention, then you're, um, it's gonna be ugly. 
right? Um, and you know, it's kind of a trope, right? We go to the Cassandra Summit and we hear the horror story talks. I just got out of a great one, <laughs> Isaac and Lindsay, right? All the things that can go wrong. We know this. We, uh, so we, we teach you um, about the very user-friendly CQL, upper left, okay? Which is a, a very powerful tool. Um, CQL has a lot of things in it. Uh, and then we, uh, or at least I'm particularly fond, upper right, of teaching you how to build uh, microservice architectures, which individual services are responsible for their data types. Um, no, don't take a picture of this part. Uh, oh, and then bottom, bottom left, there's a, uh, all the drivers that we provide that, t that help you to write and execute CQL statements. And you know, we have all these um, very elegant object models that are set up around this with CQL sessions that you can build and configure and look at this awesome fluent API. No, don't, don't look at that. <clears throat> then we taught you, okay, you need to understand the CAP theorem. This is very, very important. And I'm sorry to be so irreverent, but this is how it is. This is what we've taught you all this time, right? Uh, you can't have it all and uh, you need to be aware of replication uh, strategies and cons consistently fa consistency factories, or what is it? There's a lot of terminology. Um, not only that, uh, we don't have ACID transactions yet. Pretend that I'm not talking about 5.1 yet. Um, so we have these things called lightweight transactions where you can lock in, have consistency guarantees on individual rows, um, must be this tall, to use, we have time to live. <laughs> there was all the, m many horror stories around inconsistent settings of time to live, which is a very elegant feature. Cassandra will clean up your old expired records for you. All right, I think I've gone on a little bit long enough with this rant. So, uh, what what I've been working on uh, for the past couple of years is I switched over to the engineering side and started working on making Cassandra easier for developers um, instead of trying to help people work around all the hard parts, which is still a great and valid thing to do. Thank you, advocates. All right, so here's approach one. Let's make it easier with APIs, okay? Look at all the complexity of setting up um, and um, using a driver to talk to a database. And that's, that, you know, I've already left out all the data modeling parts. Or you could just call an, H, uh, an, an API. HTTP is great, right? Um, so this is the mission, Stargate, Captain's Log, Stargate 2023. All right, so we produced APIs. Um, but there's, there's more irreverence, I'm, I'm apologizing in advance, okay? Um, this is a slide that we presented quite a lot. Uh, we have multiple different APIs that are part of the Stargate project. So there's a gRPC API, which is basically CQL over HTTP. Um, there's two different flavors of GraphQL API. One of them is a little more CQL centric. One of them is a little more GraphQL centric. Um, we have a RESTful API, which uh, models your key space and table name as elements on the URL path, and then everything else is in a JSON body. Um, and then we have a document API which um, does something similar with key spaces and tables and tries to allow you to provide a blob of JSON, generic JSON, and we'll figure out how to put it in the database for you. This last one is pretty promising. It's the only one that doesn't bleed CQL all over you. See, the, pa the trap that we fell into with designing a lot of these APIs, especially these ones in the middle, is we uh, made them expose things that you would expect and syntax that you would expect to find from CQL. Uh, it turns out that once you start doing that, you can never stop because you will continually receive feature request after feature request to add more of the CQL syntax into those kinds of APIs. Uh, you'll probably never catch up, and, and we certainly haven't. So uh, what we did a few months ago um, is to stop listening to all the people that told us how great those other APIs were and decide that we were really gonna go forward and create a new document style API. So uh, the substance of that is covered, the, uh, the technical details of that are covered in Aaron's talk from a little bit before, which the title of which escapes me, but that's great because I have it on a couple slides uh, down from now and I'll share it with you. So JSON API. 
the thing that, we've, that we realized is we needed to start being idiomatic. So instead of pushing all of our CQL all over you all the time, what we really needed to do was provide APIs or even a single API that really just expresses a simple way of doing things. And HTTP is very helpful uh, and, and you know, having, having that structure is great, but really most developers don't like write cur a bunch of curl commands and then type that, that, that you know what I mean, that exact syntax of a, of a web query into their program. That's not how you do things, right? You usually have a client library that helps you to do things. So uh, what we've got is a whole explosion of client libraries that are uh, becoming helpful with our new API. So to uh, and Aaron, I'm, I'm going to do a quick recap of some, uh, a couple of, of key points that Aaron made in his talk. Um, first thing, we actually started from the outside in and said, what is a really great developer experience around a document API? We looked at the JavaScript community and said, this is a community that does a lot with JSON. Document is very natural for them. There's a lot of Mongo usage there. How, did the, how do people in the JavaScript community do uh, document style APIs. So we partnered with Valery Karpov, Mongoose Project. Um, he did a great talk at a virtual uh, conference that we did back in March called Cassandra Forward, kind of also under this um, Cassandra Summit umbrella, where we talked about the, the evolution of that project. So I'm going to talk about a couple of the elements of that. Um, it, it's pretty simple in its architecture. So we have an API called JSON API that we've developed that sits in front of Cassandra, and we have a client. So there's a Mongoose client. It's an existing client. Um, millions and millions of GitHub repos that are using this client. Yes, you can take a picture of that one. This is, this is the part where you, that's fine. I also have a link at the end, right? So uh, I have all the pertinent links at the end if you want to wait, um, and my slides are online. So. Um, yeah, take a picture, don't take a picture, it's all gettable later. Um, but the, the, uh, the Mongoose library, uh, we basically just plugged in a, a driver that allows it to talk to Cassandra through the JSON API. Um, so then the focus is, we're not really trying to teach you how to use a new HTTP API. For most users, the, the idea that it's some API currently called the JSON API, at least that's the name of the repo right now, we could name it to something else. You don't probably care because you'll actually be using an idiomatic client for your programming language. That's the whole strategy. Okay, so what does this look like? Super fast, I'm not gonna read the code to you, um, but it's, it's pretty simple. On the left side, all we're doing is connecting, uh, initializing a mongoose client that's connecting to a particular database, uh, plugging in, the Stargate Mongoose library so that we can connect to uh, Astra or an open source uh, uh, offering. Um, so we, we, can, we have a, a way where you can just download Docker containers and run this on your desktop, and it, yes, it works just fine. We also do deploy it in Astra. On the right side, it's a very simple interaction model. So uh, because Mongoose is an object data mapper, you create an object, you, you define a schema, uh, for, that's going to um, describe your JSON data, and then it's a very simple interaction to um, create an object, populate the different fields, hit save, um, and then you'll see some of the uh, some similar looking syntax that it involves uh, the ability to find data on the following slides. So this is idiomatic to a JavaScript developer. That's the way that they would like to interact with data. Okay. So the details of the JSON API are, actually some of the syntax looks quite a bit similar. It is a JSON-based API. So we have the ability to create a collection of documents, upper left. We have the ability to insert one or insert many, or we have update, update many. Um, these operations allow you to provide JSON documents, or the, you know, with update, you can patch portions of JSON documents. There's a bunch of syntax that you can see the details of from Aaron's talk. On the right side, you can see some of the different find operations. Uh, these can get pretty interesting. Uh, there's even a find one and update that is a combo kind of read, update, and write uh, type of operation. Um, so you can do some pretty sophisticated and pretty selective um, kind of data manipulations. 
using this API. And yes, we took as inspiration the things that you could do uh, in the Mongoose API to basically let it help us derive what operations needed to be on the JSON API. So super powerful API. Um, probably about two thirds of what Aaron went through was the interactions that, uh, how, how this translate, how all this translates into CQL queries that are made on the database. So I'm, I'm not gonna re-explain um, this portion of it, uh, I, but uh, this was sort of prefixed in his presentation by the, this is highly offensive to people that know CQL. The idea that we would be creating a table with uh, so many indexes on it, I haven't even shown all the indexes that we create on each table on this slide. But we're using something called storage attached index, which is new to Cassandra, uh, coming in the, the, the 5.0 release with, in particular, some new uh, advanced features. So we'll talk a little bit about those because those are kind of key to how uh, we're enabling basically, uh, th th it'll become important in uh, making Cassandra usable for AI developers, which is the next part of the talk. Um, so we have the initial uh, storage attached index, which is under CEP7. Uh, what is just in the process, or recently completed and, and in the process of getting merged in is, uh, I guess to the 5.1 or to the trunk, is the CQL not operator in CEP29, which allows us to do some pretty cool things. Not contains for setting maps, uh, and not equals for map entries. And I don't even know if there's a CEP yet for range queries on map entries, but we make use of that to do uh, some pretty cool inequality-based filtering on the JSON API. Um, so there's Aaron's talk that you can go back and look at later. We also did a blog together on um, kind of explaining some of the basic principles. So there's two different ways to consume that information. Um, so we're on this road to deploying this JSON API and, and getting it uh, into a fully production state GA. Um, so we've been working on this for a few months. All of a sudden, uh, the Cassandra community starts talking about vector, right? We're gonna add, we're gonna make Cassandra a vector database. So um, this comment is coming in from the perspective of, uh, I guess I depicted JSON API as already being a dinosaur. Sorry about that. Um, but we have this comet coming in of this AI revolution and we're now talking about vector databases and of course we immediately pivoted and said, um, or asked ourselves the question, uh, okay, so we have a new API that's a document-based API. Is vector search uh, a valid and desirable feature for uh, a document-oriented style of interaction? Yes, the answer very much yes. So we have this, uh, Additional CEP related to SAI, which is CEP 30, uh, the ANN vector search. Um, so in short order, we've also incorporated that into the API and into our clients as well. So the cool thing is, as you know, if, if you're thinking of the idea that th does a comet destroy all life on Earth? Well, you know, not really. There's a bunch, <laughs> if there are things that get destroyed, there's a bunch of other things that start popping up uh, around it, and that, that's, uh, I'm gonna show you a bunch of these things that have started popping up uh, because we added vector search to our new API and ecosystem. So th this is where we really get in to the funnest part, making it easy for AI developers. So first of all, uh, this is from the perspective of Mongoose. So the Mongoose project itself, uh, working with Valery Karpov, we uh, started working toward adding vector as a thing that's available to uh, all Mongoose users, not, not just people that are running this with JSON API or Cassandra or Astra, right? Uh, so now when you are creating a model, you can define what uh, vector is gonna be stored um, as part of uh, each, uh, each schema that you create and uh, you know, setting uh, what your vector dimensions are and what's the algorithm gonna be um, so this is now part of the Mongoose project itself. Uh, so then when you insert data, you can provide the vector. There's a function shown here called embedding, which is sort of like, oh, we're just gonna call some other thing to embed it. We're actually uh, looking forward to providing the ability in the API uh, such that we'll calculate the vector, we'll calculate the embedding 
for you. So that's, a, that's something that is definitely on our roadmap. Um, and then the vector search uh, looks um, in, in an idiomatic way to the Mongoose developer. Uh, you, can, you can ask, you know, for, on a find, you, in the middle section there, you can ask for your results to be sorted based on ANN search results. Or you can also do what's known as the hybrid search, where you're doing uh, some, some attribute-based searching uh, and then also a vector-based search, where you know, you're, you're using the attributes to kind of narrow your search space, and then you want to do a similarity search on those results. So this is a common pattern that uh, is frequently used in AI applications. We have an example of this that we built. Yuki, one of the engineers on our team, uh, as soon as we finished uh, adding the vector capability uh, into the API, uh, built this photography app, which I think is, is very cool because um, it's combining actually usage of the API vector search features with also calls out to, uh, to other um, image analysis libraries. So it's a great example of how you can bring multiple different APIs together in a single application and create something pretty powerful. Um, he also wrote a blog about it, which we've linked there and I'll give you the link to the repo at, at the end. So uh, there has been a focus in everything I've talked about so far in terms of JavaScript developers, and it's a pretty sophisticated ecosystem um, that's, that is b starting to be built out. Um, so uh, I'll confess to you that I, um, I had to resist the temptation um, through, throughout the past you know, two days of this conference to um, come in and keep editing and adding things to the slide because um, one of the awesome things about being at the end of the conference is you get to learn a bunch of stuff and then you want to go add it all to your slides so you can talk about all the other things. And sorry, Kirsten, I didn't add the, the CLI to the Java ecosystem. But there's that temptation to come in and, and uh, absorb and, and add in all this stuff. And I will say that I, I haven't really been at a conference before where um, everyone else was, was changing all their slides, not because they waited to the last minute to do their slides, but because literally the technology is being written and we're just trying to keep up and make the slides with all the stuff, the new technology that we're creating. That's a pretty exciting place to be in. Uh, so the JavaScript ecosystem, uh, we actually have, in upper right, we have the, the Mongoose um, like object data mapper kind of style client. Um, we, we were able to pretty quickly factor out the core of that into a non-object uh, data mapper version of that that's called AstroDBTS. So there's a, there's a TypeScript version uh, of, of that client library. Um, and then there's integrations that are built in. So the, uh, the integrations that we have for Langchain and Llama Index um, are already incorporating the, those JavaScript um, clients are already in, integrating the Mongoose library. Uh, we just, I did allow myself this one last minute edit of the slide deck today. Uh, we did just release uh, this morning a, a blog about our Taylor Swift chatbot that we can add. Um, I'll let you go play with this or we can, or you can come up afterwards and we can ask it questions if you want. Um, and I have the link to the actual uh, app, which you can use. Don't go and use, I didn't put the link in here because I don't want you to go use it right now. Uh, we'll do that at the end. Um, the source code is available for that. Um, and I, I think we will take a quick look at uh, some of the source for this because I, I was so curious myself. Um, that, you know, there's a bunch of stuff here, uh, the layout of the app and all that. But I, I went in here and just looked at the chat library um, to see. I was like, oh, of course, I'm not connected to the internet. That turns out to be important. Okay, let's come back and do that later. It, um, if, I can get it, if I can get it working, I'll show it to you. But it basically, like, the part that, uh, you know, does the database query, to, to, it's a rag style application. And it's like, you know, it's five lines of code where we're going and retrieving uh, the vector data that helps us narrow down the set of uh, input that we're going to pass uh, into the LLM for the call. And I just, it was so wonderful and pleasing and amazing to me that it was like, we did all this work on the back end so that you could write five lines of JavaScript and build a chat app. 
brings a tear to my eye. OK, so jo uh, we have something for other people as well. There's an uh, equivalent uh, uh, to the ecosystem on the Python side. Um, so we also have uh, AstroPy has integrated uh, through its vector store class. That's actually just a, a little layer on top of the JSON API. Um, so if you are going to be doing um, kind of a document style interaction, that's going through AstroPy. And then if you are going to do some more of a uh, classic kind of uh, CQL type of interaction, um, CASIO does that, although it does provide a nice abstraction. And thanks to Stefano's talk, I know that it doesn't bleed very much CQLisms <laughs> on you. Reference my earlier rant. Uh, no, it's quite a nice library. Uh, and then we have equivalent, um, so for the Python world, we have the Lang Langchain and Llama index integrations. Um, so the syntax is going to look, uh, you know, the, the feel of this is going to be pretty much the same as we've uh, seen in some of the other examples, except, you know, it's idiomatic to Python. We get our data back in dictionaries and, you know, all, all this manner of things. So uh, the Java ecosystem, uh, so there's also um, an Astra client. Uh, so Langchain for J is what we have in the Langchain world. Um, and then I've, I've just highlighted some of the key classes in these APIs here. So there's also an Astra client uh, for Java. So we're not neglecting. Um, so again, we have all these uh, client libraries in uh, multiple different languages. This is going to continue to explode as the little baby pine trees come and uh, grow up and, and populate our forest of AI tools. Um, OK, I took a big risk here because um, I, I provided an incomplete view of what is going to, is, is it growing and will be a massive ecosystem, right? Um, and this is admittedly centered around things that work with the JSON API. So I'll just highlight a couple of things. Um, don't tell me my arrows are wrong, although, I mean, you can tell me my arrows are wrong. I like to learn. So uh, w one of the things that uh, we are working on is this idea of the JSON API being able to uh, call uh, embedding services on your behalf. So um, this is an arrow that doesn't yet exist, but will in the near future. So we like this idea that there are these two paradigms in working with a powerful database like Cassandra. So there's the classic CQL base that you've always been able to do. And now we have this new document-based paradigm that sits on top of it. So do you have to choose? Where is all this going? Um, here's another uh, couple of slides where we're going to talk about what's coming. Um, there's no dates or guarantees or implications of anything, right? Um, right now, we have a, a preview available in Datastax Astra, so you can run and play around with all this stuff um, without having to install and configure anything. Um, so there are, there are instructions for um, creating a vector database in Astra, and uh, then some instructions that are available on how to use some of the different clients, like the Mongoose in particular. And then, uh, so we've just added the vector search capability to the JSON API. Um, there are things like people are asking, can you have analyzers? Can you do text search features? Um, this has already been, uh, at, uh, or is, I'd say, is, is in the process of being added um, as a feature of Astra and then coming uh, as an um, open source contribution for SAI. So. Um, Guess what? We'll probably be including that in the JSON API as well. Um, similar idea, you know, people want to be able to do geospatial searches. Okay, we can look at doing that. I'm just throwing out the laundry list of things that were being asked. Um, the, I've mentioned this idea of being able to actually calculate embeddings on people's behalf, and you know, who knows what else is next. But um, one of the things that I think is really cool is the JSON API is itself a source of search requirements. For SAI. So there's actually, you know, we could draw a little spiral of interchange where we have these two different views of data, CQL and JSON. And then there's some complementary things that are happening in terms of changes to Cassandra that are going to bring a lot of power to CQL 
and a JSON. And then, you know, maybe these will actually even be more and more interchangeable and interoperable over time. All right, so this is a conversation starter for you and me after this talk. Um, I've had a couple of people hit me up lately about, hey, you should write a book. Hey, Jeff, you should write another book. Um, I don't know why I entertain these conversations. It's a lot of work to write a book. But um, people have hit me up with a couple of ideas, and I'm looking for input on what to do. Or just to talk about books, and it, that, that's fine too. Um, so yeah, there's a definitive guide that has not been updated for Cassandra 5. Could do that. Could write a new book on uh, Cassandra for AI specifically. Um, could write a book about vector databases. Or maybe you would like to tell me that no one is going to need books anymore because we have LLMs. This is also a valid input. Uh, so I'm curious about what you think in, in having a lot of these conversations. Um, is there something, is there some body of knowledge that is emerging and is well-defined enough that it's not going to be irrelevant if we write something in six months that will have some staying power? Um, hey, I'd love to know what you think about it. Uh, and that is the conclusion of this presentation. Thank you. I'll take some questions if I have time. I don't know if I went over, or I guess I'm two minutes over. But there's no more talks after this, so that's right. We can do whatever we want. We can go have adult beverages. Um, you could have left at any time, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah, grab this one because, you know, all the stuff that I flew by and made reference to, the links are on here. There's a QR code about uh, where you can go and just get on to Astra quickly and get going with a bunch of this stuff. So I'll leave this up and, um, yeah. You can ask me something if you want, and then I'll turn my mic off and we'll go. Any burning questions? Which one do you want? Which one flies in your Oh, I uploaded the whole deck to the to yeah. If you go to my talk in the website or the app, it should the it should all be there. Yeah, you can. Oh yeah, do you want to, guys want to do demos? We, or we can we can go play with the app now. I've got a question. Yeah. I have no idea. It's not where the expo hall was. All right, go on, get out of here. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>